So what, what we'll do today is, um, is, is finish up uh, the, the, the discussion of barrier methods, maybe start on these L1 uh, convex cardinality type things. So let, let, let's take a look at that. So um, just to remind you what it was, um, we are going to look at using a barrier method. Barrier, is a, barrier method is a pretty simple thing. It's, uh, let me go find it. Let me, there we, there we go. So um, it simply says uh, we, we find a point on the central path. Uh, you use Newton's method to do that. Then, then you increment this barrier parameter T that controls the gap and you compute the new point and you keep doing this, right? And you know, at some point, actually every time you center, you end up with two things, strictly, uh, strictly feasible primal point, that's X. You also end up with strictly feasible dual point, and you have a gap, that means. And the gap is precisely m over t. t is that parameter that controls the, the level of approximation. So, so basically, you, can, you keep increasing t until m over t, which is the gap, is less than whatever your, uh, thresh, whatever your desired threshold is, right? So that's the method. I think we talked about that last time. This is a homotopy method. Um, it's kind of a special one, because homo general homotopy methods are much more complex, because paths can just stop, or they can bifurcate, or they can just start in the middle of nowhere. Here, that's false. And not, we can, no matter where you are, you can always get back to the central path. It may cost you a bunch of Newton steps, but you can always do it. So, okay, that's the barrier method. And what we're gonna do now is look at, uh, we're gonna look at the complexity analysis of it. I think I mentioned last time that according to the classical analysis, um, the upper bound on the number of Newton steps grows as the barrier method, as, as T increases, right? And so that, if you sort of believe that that upper bound had any meaning, you might actually be, you might shy away from even attempting this because you'd say, well, sure, as T gets bigger and bigger, the, the, little, the problems we solve by Newton's method get harder and harder. It takes more and more iterations and so on and so forth. And then you get into some kind of um, uh, doom spiral there or whatever. This actually kind of happened in the 60s. Um, weirdly, I don't know why, but okay. Um, so it turns out that's not true. Uh, you could have guessed that because you've already seen empirical results for how well the barrier method works, which is, by the way, just unbelievably well. So basically, and it's got a very weird interpretation, right? The one interpretation of it's working so well is that it takes between 20 and you solve between 20 and 50 least squares problems to solve, to solve a convex optimization problem with inequality constraints, all that kind of stuff. It's crazy, right? Um, why do I say you solve least squares problems? Is because you do 20, between 20 and 50 Newton steps total, but a Newton step is actually solving a, a set of KKT, a KKT, a linear, a set of linear KKT systems, which is precisely solving a least squares, pro it's exactly the same as solving a least squares problem with equality constraints, right? So, so it's actually kind of cool. So you can, it says basically you can, uh, solve a convex, any convex problem by solving between 20 and 50 least squares problems that have the same structure and so on. So that's, that, that's actually kind of, I mean, I, I, I find that kind of interesting. And uh, by the way, also, it, it, well, let's see. People, if, if people had been awake in the 60s, uh, they would, people would have noticed this, right? Uh, so this wasn't mainstream until the 90s or something like, but before then, this would have been just completely, uh, you know, radical and unheard of. So, okay, that's the background. Now what we're going to do is let's, let's see if we can get the theory to catch up with the practice. Um, so, uh, and that, that comes via self-concordance analysis, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to simply assume that the problems, that the centering problem, the objective is self-concordant. And that's true for actually a whole bunch of the things that we actually, we, we care about, like logs. And then this is the entire, this is like basically all of it. This is also the densest chain of inequalities, I think, that have appeared in uh, lecture slides that I'm aware of. Um, I couldn't follow it, so I had to work it out myself this morning. So we will go through this uh, together now a bit. Um, I mean, eventually I followed it, you know, so. Um, so let's remember what we're doing. We are, we're on the central path at a point, uh, I'll draw a central path. So here's the central path. You know, here's, here's the optimal point. Here's the, here, here we are. So we're at, we're at X, we're at X of uh, T 
And then we're going to increase t by mu. We're going to have t times equals mu. And this is going to be x of mu t. And we're going to call this guy x plus, like that. Okay? So we're going to, we're going to do uh, a step of the barrier method, which is to use Newton's method to go from here to here. Okay? So that's, the, uh, that, 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 that's what we're going to analyze. What we're going to try to do is bound the number of steps it takes to do that, the number of Newton steps, right? Um, okay, so uh, we go back to self-concordance analysis and we ask, well, how, how, much, how many Newton steps does it take to compute this thing starting from here, right? And the answer is, you look at the function you're minimizing, uh, which is, uh, it's this, it's, it's mu t. So we start uh, when you, let's see, let me write down what this is. So x plus is the argmin, right, of t mu, or I'll write it as mu t, f0 of x, plus sum, um, and this is over i of, uh, this is the barriers, right? Right? And then, uh, then sub, this is, uh, and then plus the indicator function, of, uh, I guess we write it as ax equals b. Looks like that, okay? So uh, you're basically minimizing uh, this function uh, subject to these equality constraints, right? So that, that, that's literally the definition of what x plus is, right? If I remove this, this is the definition of x. So, and in fact, that's kind of the point, right? The whole point here is, is, is that we just computed this. Now we increase t. And so the idea is this problem is very, should be relatively close to the previous one. And that hopefully will save us some Newton steps or something like that. That's, that's, that's the hope here. So this is the minimizer. Okay. So the general self-concordant theory says that the number of steps, the number of Newton steps is less than or equal to the function value where you start minus the function value where you end, which is its optimal value, and then multiplied by a constant. And you could either use our lazy constant as like you divide by 365 or something like that, or maybe you multiply by 360, I think you multiply by 365. And then you add something that looks like log log one over epsilon, which we just call five or six, and that's fine. Everybody got that? So this is, that's the C over there, right? So this is the function value uh, at x of t, that's x, that, which we're just gonna call x in, over here. That's this guy here. And then this is going to be the function value when you finish, because x plus minimizes this thing subject to the equality constraints, right? So that's what that is. Okay, so that's the number of Newton iterations, and our job is to uh, get an upper bound on, on this big thing here. Uh, forget the C for the moment, uh, and let's just take a look at this thing. And now we go kind of very slowly, um, or I'll, I'll, I'll expand various things, right? Um, so uh, the first question is how on earth do you get, how do you go from this line to this line? And that's an equality constraint. And so I think that is written uh, here. We use the fact that phi of x minus phi of x plus, so phi of x is the sum of the, it's minus the sum of the log of minus fi of x. Right? This is the same thing evaluated at x plus. So, so this difference looks like that. It doesn't look like it. It's equal to it. Right? So this is, this is the difference, right? It's, the, it, it's uh, this rate, the log of this ratio. I leave the minus signs there just, I don't know. Of course, you could get rid of them. They're both negative, both fi of x and fi of x plus, because they're both strictly feasible. OK. Now, now we're going to use the following. Uh, lambda i. That, these are, the, these are the, the dual variables associated with the inequality constraints associated with computing a, a point on the central path. That's equal to this. And you realize that, hey, that, this kind of looks like that, right? So it says minus 1 over, fi, uh, 1 over minus fi of x, that's, that's the denominator here, is equal to t lambda i. So I plug t lambda i in instead of that, and I get this, okay? So that, that I think, made, that, that makes sense. Um, Okay, and I, I do that. And then what I'm gonna do, very weirdly, is I'm gonna do the following, um, if you don't mind. Um, I'm gonna put a mu here, and then go minus, law, uh, let's see, minus, um, I'm, gonna put, I'm gonna put a, a mu in there, and then I'm gonna say maybe plus log mu. I think I got that right, right? Because 
uh, here, I, I, I multiply this thing by mu. There's a minus sign, and I think I go plus log mu. I think that's right. Is that right, or did I do that the wrong way? I think I did it, yeah, I did it the wrong way. Um, let me see. Um, so it looked like that. I'm going to multiply this by mu, I, so I have to do this. There we go. And now that didn't change. So this is going to be what you see over there. And this is a sum over i of log mu, but there's m in that sum. So that's m log mu. So I think we got to, uh, we, we, we've, we've verified uh, this line here. So, OK. Um, next up, we're going to go from this line to this line. A lot of the terms are the same, right? These, these are the same. That's the same. And um, here, uh, I'm only going to use one inequality, which again goes back to week two of the class, which is just, um, I'm going to use Jensen's inequality that says that for any positive number, log a is less than a minus one, right? Which, by the way, all these weird inequalities that you know, um, now you'll probably remember that, you'll probably recognize that almost all of them follow directly, they're just Jensen's inequality for something, right? So this just says, this just says, you know, look at the, you know, the Taylor expansion of log a around a equals one, and you get this inequality. Okay, um, so that means here I can take I can I can take this thing. If I replace if I remove the log and subtract one, I get a lower bound. So that's this next term here. So I get I get this. I get here. I get minus one. I sum over m of them. So I get minus m, and I get this thing that's just that down here. And I pulled out the mu and the t that don't depend on i. So, um, OK. Uh, now, the next one is this. The, the, the next trick is to recognize a couple of things here. Uh -huh. OK, here it is. We recognize um, mu t. Forget the mu t on these two terms. This is f0 of x plus, And this is some lambda i fi of x plus. Um, but that. That basically is nothing but, that is exactly the Lagrangian. Let me write that out. Um, that's actually the Lagrangian uh, at, let's see, that's lambda nu and x plus, right? That, that's what that is, right? Right, because that's the, oh, uh, there's, there's one more term. The other term would be to have a new transpose ax minus b, but x is feasible. So ax is equal to b, and that other term, it doesn't appear there. So, so L of lambda nu x plus is precisely F0 plus some lambda i fi, OK? But we know the following. Um, this thing is for sure bigger than or equal to G of lambda nu, because the dual function is what minimizes this over all x's, and this is just a particular x. So, so this is for sure true. So then what we do, we go back over here in the world's densest one slide derivation. Um, and we replace the f0 of x plus some lambda i f i with, with a lower bound, which is the g. OK? Um, and that goes the right, I think that goes the right way. It does go the right way, right? Um, OK. Now we look at this thing and we say, well, wait a minute, uh, f0 of x minus g of lambda nu is the gap at x lambda nu. But that's precisely m over t. That's the calculation we did before, right? So, so this minus g, that's m over t. So I have mu t times m over t, and I end up with just this. So um, I, I think that was coherent. Um, so um, OK, yeah. The i is associated with x instead of x plus. Which one? Lambda i. Is no. that defined lambda i as? No, no. The lambda i's are the lambda i's are, are with respect to x here. Yeah. Not x plus. But the uh, Lagrangian that you yeah. uh -huh. equate to g is, is in terms of x plus. No? no, 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 certainly not. It is up here. Um, if I, this is where I, what, to get this, I replace the x plus with x in the Lagrangian. So no, this, this, is, this, this is right. Yeah. OK. All right. So what does mu minus 1 minus log mu look like? So let me, let me draw that. Um, 
So that's going to look something like this, right? So it's, it's mu minus 1 minus log mu. Now, mu is bigger than 1, right? Because mu is the amount by which we crank up t at each, at each step of the barrier method. So this is 1. This thing is 0 here. Also, its derivative is 0 here. And its second derivative is like 1, right? So this, this looks like, at least locally, something like that, a square. That's what that looks like. And what this says, I mean, you end up with a stunning answer, right? It, it basically says, if I divide that, this multiplied by a number, and then you add 6, that's number bound on the number of Newton steps it takes you uh, to compute uh, the x of mu t starting from x of t. These are two points on the central path. Right, and that's the bound, and it's actually kind of cool. What it does is it 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 does say that as mu gets bigger and bigger, uh, the bound goes up, but it does say that if you take like really small steps, it doesn't it does it's not going to take much at all. Actually, at that point, the five or the six, which is our way to say log log one over epsilon, is going to dominate. Right. So, okay, this. Okay, now you simply assemble things. You say, well, the. The number of Newton steps, remember, is this is exactly the number of outer steps you'll take because you'll start with an initial gap. This is basically the initial gap and then divided by log mu. Uh, so if mu is like really small, you'll take a whole bunch of steps, but you'll make small, you'll make a progress, which is exactly a factor of mu and duality gap each step. Um, and then this is the number of, that's our bound on the number of, the upper bound on the number of Newton steps to compute x at mu t given you've just computed it at x t, right? And so now when you multiply these two things together, you get something that looks like this. It's actually really cool. Um, and here I'm using our lazy numbers, right? Uh, our lazy numbers in the bound, I forget what they were. Uh, they were, I think it's 365 times the difference in objective value plus six or something. And you get something that looks like this, right? And this is very, very cool. What it does is it says there is indeed a trade-off of mu. If you take mu too small, then you're going to be, it, it's, this term is going to give you a lot of, uh, you're going to have to, you're going to have to do many, many outer iterations, right? If you take mu too big, it says this term is going to start dominating and it'll look like that. And this says that somewhere, you know, for this particular problem with a hundred inequalities and a, a duality gap reduction of 10 to the five, it says that the optimal mu is around, you know, 1.03 or something, right? Um, actually, I'm pretty sure this is using our um, lazy bound, which has got 365, a, a more careful Russian bound, you know, where you go through lots of pages of analysis, makes that number closer to 11 or 12. So it's about 30. And then I think actually you get something, you know, it's, it's actually instead of point, 1 point, you know, 0.02, it's something like 1.3, which is at least less ridiculous, but it doesn't matter. It looks the same, right? Um, Right. So, oh, and also you can notice the number of, you know, you, you can look at the theory here and it will say, it will say the good news is that the total number of iterations is less than uh, 8,000. There, there you go. Okay. So, um, but I mean, we all know that as an empirical fact, it takes between 20 and 80 steps, like always, like there's never been any experience otherwise. Everybody got this? So, I guess it's not so bad. If you take 8,000 and divide it by 36, which is the ratio of the lazy bound to the other one, you get something that's m much more reasonable, I think. Uh, but anyway, okay. Um, so that's pretty cool. So actually, I mean, these two slides would have been like completely radical in the year, I don't know, you know, 1990 or something like that. Um, so, and in fact, something not too dissimilar ended up on the cover of, cover of the New York you know, the front page of the New York Times, right? So, which is another story, but it's a, a, a weird one. Okay, so, okay. Now, if you want, if, if you want to go all the way on, on, on this, what you do is you say, well, I can take this function here, which is my upper bound on the total number of Newton steps, and I can minimize it over mu, which you can do. I mean, it's not that hard to do. You don't do it exactly, because all of this is sloppy, and it's all silly because this is all upper bounds and all that kind of stuff. But if you do, what you'll find out is that you would like to choose mu to be on the order something like that. That's very close in order to what the minimizer would be. If you plug that back in, you get something amazing. It says that the number of steps is, uh, it's on the order of the square root of m, and then there's a log m term. I ignore that. I guess if you're a complexity theory, you'd uh, 
theorist, you don't, right? The, the log m. So it's square root m log m is, is the complexity. I think people just quote it as square root m, right? So, so um, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, so, I mean, in fact, most people would choose, don't, yeah, uh, choose mu's that are much larger. Um, and in fact, people, people refer to methods that have small mu. They refer to those as short step methods. And then ones where you actually are much more aggressive in, a, in, a, in adapting mu are called long step methods. You might see this if you start looking at some of the papers from the 90s and the aughts and all that kind of stuff. You, you would actually see this in titles of papers, like you know a long step primal dual method, blah, 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 something like that. Okay, so, um, so this is actually like, I, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, this is, uh, it, it, this, this is sort of how the, uh, you know, the, the, the theory and the practice are, are approximately consistent. Um, but uh, what I should tell you, I mean, I'll explain this later. What I should tell you though, is that there's kind of a, there's been a kind of a leapfrog thing where the, you know, people working on practical implementations of interior point methods or barrier methods actually will do something not justified by the theory. And it will work better. And they will run it on test suites of thousands of problems and blah, blah, but re release something maybe commercially or whatever. And um, what will happen then typically is five years later, the theorists will catch up and show that a, vari a simplified variation of that method actually is like polynomial time or something. And then by then, the people actually working on the methods will come up with something else, right? And extend it. So there are periods like every couple of years when the theory and the practice are in sync but it doesn't last very long, right? And as soon as that happens, I mean, so that's, that's, that's actually the story, but okay. Uh, oh, first of all, any, 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 any questions about this? It's kind of a, this is kind of an amazing, it's kind of cool stuff, but if, if not, we'll, we'll move on. Um, you probably guessed that the way everything was set up, the same, the exact same methods are gonna work for generalized inequalities, right? And so, and you're right. And this is how you'd solve like SOCPs, semi-definite programs, things like that. Um, so, which, of, of which you've solved a whole bunch already. So, um, well, sorry, you didn't, but CVXPy, you, you typed in CVXPy, CVXPy compiled your problem to some standard form and then called one of some number of solvers. So, you, you've solved a, you, you have solved a bunch of SDPs in that spirit. So, okay. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these. Uh, these um, we're going to have cone in a, uh, cone constraints like this, right? So f i is a vector, and you know the most interesting one is going to be um, things like SOCP and SDPs, right? So, um, so if you think about it, we have to just go back and generalize everything. Now, before we had f i of x, f i of x was a number, right? Minus f i of x, we thought as a margin. And minus log minus f i of x was this barrier function. It was convex. And you know, as you got to the boundary, the boundary being f i equals zero, this thing would go to plus infinity. So that was our barrier. But now, I mean, let's suppose I have some cone. Let's imagine it's like the semi-definite cone or something like that. You need to have something that's going to be the same as a, a, a logarithm. So you need the idea of a logarithm on a cone. Um, so what you do is you generalize this to have, you say that a generalized logarithm, it, it's a function that is, its domain is the interior, so that makes perfect sense. Um, it's concave, it's strictly concave. That's what the second term mean, means. Um, and in fact, this is, uh, this is actually concave um, in, in the, it, it's con they'll just say it's concave, right? Um, and then it has to actually kind of agree with a logarithm on any ray. Right, and it's so it's got to look like this. If you multiply phi with some scalar s here, phi of s y, that's going to be phi of y plus theta log s. So it has to look exactly like a a log on any ray. Okay, so you do get things like this. Oh, and this number uh, theta is called the degree of of that of that logarithm. Right. So here, like if you have the non-negative orthon, if if you use this construct, you just end up with the same barrier we had before. Right or the or the this is this is the this is the log of for you know of the non-negative orthon the log of a vector is this thing right something like it's a generalized logarithm 
What's interesting is much more interesting is what happens on like a semi-definite cone. There, surprise, surprise, our friend log determinant, which goes back, you know, whatever, to week two of the class. Um, that's a, not surprisingly, that's a generalized logarithm on the positive definite cone. Okay? So it's, it's got a lot of the things you would like on it, right? It's, it's also correct, right? If you go an array of matrices, we already saw that. That's actually how we prove concavity. Now, this thing looks exactly like a logarithm, right? So that's it. And here, the, uh, the, the so-called degree is n, right? And for a second order cone, you get something that looks like this. Um, this is not, it's not totally obvious that that's uh, concave, but it is. Actually, I don't think it's that hard to show. You know, the only one that would be tricky would be this part. So, okay, sorry, the others. All right, so there's a bunch of properties. If you have a, a generalized logarithm, you can figure out like what happens, right? Um, one is that the gradient is non-negative um, in the dual cone. Um, if you have y transpose uh, times the gradient of the logarithm, you just get theta. It's just a constant. Um, and you know, so for a non-negative orthon, if you want to check uh, that, uh, the gradient is going to be this. I guess you've you've seen that, right? And then if you take y transpose, you know, times this gradient, you just get n because you just you take y times one over y and so on, y one times one over y one and so on. So you just get this. Okay. And for positive semi-definite cone, it's actually super interesting. The gradient of the log determinant is the inverse matrix, right? You have to interpret that super carefully, but that's what it is. That's the inverse. And the inner product between two symmetric matrices is the trace of the product, right? Because that, that's actually the inner product. It's the sum of the products of the corresponding entries, right? And so that, of course, is n because trace of y times y inverse is the trace of i, which is n, okay? So these things work. Second order cone, you know, same, same story if you work out what this is. Um, okay, so, all right, so that's your, uh, that, that, that's this property of the logarithmic, uh, of the generalized logarithm. Armed with that, we can actually define a logarithmic barrier. So the log, log barrier is going to be this. I have a bunch of cone inequalities, but they are, sorry, I have a bunch of inequalities, but they're respect to some cone here, like here, a K1 and up, up to K sub M, right? So we form this thing, that's going to be the log barrier. And this is exactly like in the case when the inequalities were scalars. It's identical, right? Or at least the form is identical, right? It's a bit more complicated, right? These are vectors now. Um, and this thing is convex, it's twice continu continuously differentiable, and this allows us to talk about a central path. But now we can talk about things like the central path for a semi-definite program or a second order cone program. And it, it's, it's, it's actually identical, right? X star of t is the minimum of this thing. And the only difference is we have changed, phi, we've generalized phi to handle generalized, in, generalized inequalities for the constraints. So the barrier has just changed. That's the only thing that ever changed. Does this make, make sense? So, okay. Um, everything else is going to work, right? If you look at the optimal, if you minimize that the function t times the function plus a barrier, um, then you will get this thing called x star of t. That's the central path. That's a point on the central path associated with the parameter value t. And if you work out the optimality condition, it just looks like this. And when you work this out, it's identical. Um, it says that if, if this holds, then it turns out x star of t also minimizes the Lagrangian with this particular choice of lambda i of t and nu of t. And if you look back at what it was for the scalar case, it's, I, it's just exactly the same. It's, it's the same. Um, okay. Uh, and we know that this is going to be non-negative in the dual norm, right? And then it turns out the gap is the same. This used to be, like you can think about this for the types of things, if you had, if the constraints do not involve generalized or vector inequalities, each of these is one, right? And so this, this term is just m over t. That's the term we were just looking at. It's the m over t from over there. But now instead of m, you replace m, not the number of constraints, but actually the sum of the degree, the total sum of degrees, right? Which is actually kind of not obvious, right? Because if, you, if I give you a single semi-definite constraint with a 10 by 10 matrix, how many, you know, and I ask you how many constraints is that? It's not clear. It's, it's a single vector constraint, right? Where 
it's a positive semi-definite matrix. Or you could say, well, it's like n, n plus one over two constraints, because that's the number of scalars in a symmetric 10 by 10 matrix, right? But 55 is not right either, because I think that's what you'd get. And what this says is, for this, for this purposes, it's 10. It acts as if a semi-definite inequality with a 10 by 10 matrix is roughly equivalent to 10 scalar inequalities. That's what this is saying here. Okay. Um, so now you get cool stuff. Um, you get semi-definite programming. Um, you know, you work out uh, what the what the log barrier is. Um, you work out what it is on the central path. It's it, it's this. Um, you get dual points. Is is this thing? Um, and this is the dual of of, of this uh, semi-definite program. And the duality gap is exactly p over t. P is equal to the size of these matrices, right? Because that's the degree of the logarithm on the positive definite cone. Okay. Well, now you have the barrier method. Here it is. Um, you look at it for a minute, and here's what you'll find out. Nothing changed, at least in form. N nothing changed. Oh, the only thing was you had to replace m. This used to be m, and now it's the sum of the theta i's over t, right? So in, some, in something like Julia, it would mean that your code from before would actually probably just work literally just work, right? I mean, you go back and you have to make sure that a logarithm is defined correctly and all that, but it would just work. Um, and you can see it's, it's just exactly the same. Um, and you get the same, the complexity analysis just applies like just immediately, it just works. Except wherever I said m over here, you replace it with some theta i. Okay, so this is pretty cool. Um, and I mean, maybe more important, at least certainly more important to me, is that it actually it actually works super well in practice. Um, so, what's kind of crazy is if you look at these things, they they look exactly like the ones we saw before for linear programs, quadratic programs, geometric programs. They look kind of the same, right? That you know, uh, everything's over and somewhere between twenty and fifty steps if you choose mu reasonably. Um, you see all sorts of stuff. I mean, you couldn't tell any difference between these. This this plot looks exact. These look exactly like they did uh, for other, you know, for the for the for solving an LP, right? So it's just the same. Um, and the fancier methods, I'll talk about them uh, briefly, but th they they would come in between twenty and fifty, just always. That's how that works, right? So. By the way, this is pretty cool because I started I started using semi-definite programming for problems in control actually before the advent of these methods. And we used very fan, you know, complicated methods that would take 10 minutes to solve a semi-definite program with a handful of you know, matrix inequalities that were like 10 by 10. And we were happy and we liked the results. Um, we had absolutely no idea that within a couple of years, there would be methods, there would be methods that would be 20x shorter, the code, and be 100x or 1,000x faster. Just did not, like it was a, anyway. People now, they just don't they, don't, they don't care. As a matter of fact, most people don't even care how these things are solved. They just call a solve, you know, a solver. Or, or for that matter, a, a higher level of ignorance, which is totally cool and fine, is you just use CVXPy and call the solve method. And you have absolutely no idea what's being done on your behalf at the, at the far end, which is just fine. That's the way it's supposed to be, right? So, okay. So, uh, so this shows you this kind of, this kind of works. Um, here's like just a same story. It just takes, you know, between 20 and 50 steps. Um, okay. Um, so I, I, I do want to mention something, which is uh, that these, uh, you know, the barrier method is just sort of a simple first cut. Um, I think yours is probably going to come in at around 50 lines, order magnitude. If you put a bunch of comments in there, it might be 70 or something, right? If you were to double that length, you would actually, you could actually get something that would be like, they would actually be competitive, right? So if you went to 100 lines or something like that. Um, people don't really use the barrier method that you've put together, but they put things to, but what, what are you, what is used, for example, in ECOS or in any of these things in, in, all, in all these commercial tools as well. Um, what are used are what are called primal dual interior point methods. I'll just, I'll just say a little bit about them. They're just so you know what they are. Um, so they actually update the primal dual variables at each iteration. So you don't, and you don't have the distinction between inner and, you don't have an inner, you're not going all the way back to the central path. 
right? Um, what you'll find out is if you actually look at some of these codes, you will find out that the, it's, you're still solving a KKT system at every step. So that part is exactly the same. Um, um, and let's see, I should say uh, that they, they do use something like what you're using because your, your centering method is actually an infeasible start. These also use infeasible start. Um, they use something called the primal dual homogeneous embedding. We're not going to talk about it, but it's actually very cool. It's actually, it says Stanford uh, Development. It's from uh, Inuye, right? Maybe 20 years ago. It, it is now used for all, 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 all solvers, commercial, non-commercial, everywhere. That's, that is what's used. And what it does is it, it actually solves the primal and the dual simultaneously. It handles things like infeasibility and it handles unbounded, unboundedness all of it, and just by solving one, it solves one problem. You look at two scalar variables. From them, you figure out if one is one or something like that. If one is positive, it means you found a primal dual solution. If the other is positive, it means it's either unbounded or, you know, and you get, it will actually get the certificate. It'll either give you a ray that establishes that it is unbounded below, or it'll give you a, uh, a certificate showing that the original problem is infeasible. So that, that's what that is. These are, I mean, I'm just saying this is if you're interested in this. Um, I mean, it's not, you know, some small fraction of you might actually be if you ended up implementing something like this. Um, you might not, you, have, you might not, but I'm just saying if you wanted, but if you were to read the papers, you, everything else would be complete. You would, no, you'd see everything. You'd see KK, you'd see log barriers. You'd hear self-concordance. You'd look at the KKT systems that are being solved. You'd see that we're going to, we're going to do it by reduction or we're going to do it by just using, uh, um, a primal dual, um, uh, sorry, a um, LDL transpose factorization. So you would be highly familiar. You, you, you are now ready to start reading. You could read all, I mean, I'm not recommending this, right? But at this point, you could look at any of these things. You could l actually look at the codes and everything would be very, very familiar. So, okay. So I'll, I'll quit here um, on, on, on this. Um, and let me just finish by saying, I mean, well, I don't know, unless there, maybe there's some questions about this or not. Okay. Um, yeah, so I guess in, in the ensuing 30 years, basically, these methods have taken over. They're now the default commercial solvers. So all solvers basically kind of do this. Um, there are some, you know, holdovers for linear programming is a little bit special. And so there's holdovers for that. But for everything else, it's just this. I mean, it's not, it's these, these primal dual interior point methods, right? So, okay. Um, let me finish by just saying one thing. Uh, the reason we just did the last two and a half weeks of the class and you, you are doing this homework is, uh, was purely to demystify these methods, to show they're not as complicated as they might sound. If you just jump in and start reading the papers or you start looking at codes, um, if they're open source, right? They're just not as complicated as they sound. And so it seems like a good thing to understand that actually an LP solver is not that complicated. Solving a small, you know, solving semi-definite program is not that complicated, right? Um, it's also, I mean, the, whether or not you would have to actually do any of this, it depends what you do. Um, if, you're, if you're actually involved in like weird real-time or super large scale implementations, real-time would be probably more closer to actually a realistic thing. Well, let's suppose you're flying a drone and it turns out you need to solve a small semi-definite program, I don't know, 100 times a second, okay? Um, it's actually very difficult to take a commercial solver and embed it, right? Because the commercial solver is gonna do all sorts of crazy stuff like, um, well, for one thing, it's actually gonna do things like actually ask to allocate memory, uh, which doesn't work super well uh, when you're in the air, right? And, and, and you have a, a, a 10 millisecond deadline, right? So. Um, so anyway, if I'm just saying, if you know you end up at a high frequency trading firm or something like that, and you're going to implement a tiny you know QP or LP solver that should solve in like 50 microseconds, now you know that you can do it, and it's not a big deal. So that that, that was the sole reason to do this part of the course, but I think it's actually kind of important. So, okay. Any questions about it? It's kind of cool. So actually, now the whole stack is demystified for you because here's what it does. When you type in CVXPy, CVXPy does, forms a sequence of equivalent problems. It starts with your problem, 
It does a reduction, makes it a, a, a completely equivalent problem with a retrieval method, right? Then reduces it again and again. Maybe 12, 15, 20 reductions later, it looks up and it says, I have a form that, that one of my solvers can solve. Everybody following this? Then it passes it off to the solver. They are not all uh, interior point methods. Uh, SCS, for example, is not. OSQP is not, but um, the, many others are. Uh, so ECOS, Clarabelle, um, commercial ones are, are most, almost entirely, uh, in fact, I guess almost entirely. They are, uh, they are barrier and interior point methods, right? And now you know at least a little bit of the details of those. If you go down, drill down deeper, what you know is if you profile one of these things, the, it is only doing the following, linear algebra. Absolutely nothing else. The linear algebra it's doing is actually mostly just exploiting sparsity. And that's it. So now, in a weird way, you kind of know everything, at least for the full stack from what happens when you, when you call, when you type in, you know, myprob.solve. And now you kind of know. So, yeah. Is there a difference between uh, saying interior point methods or barrier methods? Uh, yeah, let's see. No, not really. Um, so barrier method, I think, is kind of an older term. I kind of like it because it's kind of a cool retro term. But it refers to the, to the same. Like yeah, it's usually, usually pretty much the same. So yeah, so in, interior point, I think, is what most people would call it these days. So um, yeah, I mean, I, it's still, you have to admit, it's pretty stunning that you can solve an LP with like 10,000 variables and 5,000 constraints you know, in 20 iterations. That, that, and that's to like extremely high precision, right? That's, that's very weird, right? Because basically it, you're, you're, you wanna find a, a particular vertex in this, poly to, in this polyhedron of which there's like a number equal to the number of, you know, subatomic particles in the, in the universe, including dark matter, right? So that, that's, and what, what it does is it basically stops and asks for directions 20 times. That's to me, very weird. I mean, it's cool. We're all very lucky because we're beneficiaries of it, but it's very, it's very cool, right? That this, I still don't get it. Uh, there are people who claim to understand why this works, but I don't believe them. So, or at least I didn't get there with it. Yes. Can you give an example of how CDX5 reduces the problem or comes up with Sure. It, it's actually, um, so we, we did a lot, we did that, those very early on. I don't know if you remember we did that. Uh, what happens is you actually don't do a lot of those now uh, because it's done for you. Um, but the reduction would be like introduction of a Slack variable, right? Um, it would be, uh, I mean, the, the interesting ones would be how to handle, I mean, an interesting one would be how do we handle the sum of the 3.5 largest entries of a vector? That's a convex function. It's in CVX pi, some largest, x comma 3.5. Just, you don't have to think about anything. That's a much more interesting reduction. Uh, those things you can, you, you, uh, all of those you would know about, right? So there's, there's no, some of the, most of the reductions are actually really dumb. Uh, they're really boring. Like here's one. You want to maximize an objective, right? Well, none of our, none, no solver solves that problem. So here's an equivalent problem, ready? Minimize minus the objective. There you go. I mean, that's a reduction. It's kind of dumb, right? And then, and then the retrieval method is simple. The retrieval method is you, that you, you, you just replicate X, right? The solution. But you change the optimal value by flipping the sign, right? So, so they range between, these reductions range between, most of them are deeply boring, like the one I just said. And a handful of them are actually kind of interesting. So... Uh, that, that was kind of a non-answer, but you have seen these uh, in maybe week four of the course. These, these... I guess what I'm asking, like, how do you tell which one is a useful Ah, okay, well, now we're, that's another story, right? So it actually finds a shortest path in a graph, right? So it, 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 it takes a problem, it estimates what is the most specific, I mean, this is just because you asked, right? It looks at your problem and says, I could compile that to a QP and, you know, and uh, a second order cone program or something like that, that it looks among your solvers, unless you specified one, it looks for the one that's most specific. In that case, it might pick the QP or something like that. So then it, compi then it, then it actually has a shortest path that tries to figure out, is there a sequence of transformations that will take this problem to a QP? So that, that's roughly what it does. So.
Cool. Okay. So, so weirdly, like I think now everything is demystified. I, I think for, I mean, maybe not every detail, but if you were to start reading about it, you would, everything would be completely familiar. Okay. So, uh, could do two things. We could either jump into our last uh, topic, which I think is actually, I, I think actually that's what we're going to do. I just made the decision for us. There we go. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Okay. So uh, this is th this is what we hold in reserve. Uh, at so if if we finish a bit early, which is typical, like we just did, then. Uh, will I be, we're able to go back and look at some other cool material. Um, so what we're going to do is look at um, L1 norm methods for convex cardinality problems. And I'll, I'll explain that in a, in, in a minute. You already know, I think, about the connection between L1 norms and, and, sparse, and, and sparsity, right? So, and you may, you may also have seen this in maybe a statistics class or something like that, right? So, um, I'm not sure where else it would come up, but that, that's one place where it would come up. So we'll just go a bit more into depth here, and it'll be, uh, it's actually, there's some interesting stuff, and you'll actually see some um, cool connections that will actually give you stuff that's better than merely uh, saying, you want that sparse? Rep here. And then you type out a problem with an L1 norm. You'll see that actually you can actually do better than that. Okay. So here's the idea. Um, so a cardinality, by the way, is simply the number of non-zeros of a vector. And, uh, and in fact, it's a really, it's a separable function, right? So it actually is based on this. It's based on, uh, so it's the cardinality. This is for a scalar of, let's say, A. It's equal to either 1 uh, if A is not 0 and 0 if A equals 0. Okay? So that's, uh, and if you sum this function over all the coefficients of a vector, you get the cardinality, which is the number, right? So, and this function obviously is not convex. That's, I guess that's kind of obvious. It looks like this. Um, that's empty. And that, whoop, yeah, whoops. Okay, yeah, it looks like this. And then this is, looks like it's this point. And wait, no, 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 here, it's this. And then that. So this is, or if you like, I'll, I'll make it look like that in a very weird way, right? So this is, that's the cardinality function. Okay. Um, not, uh, obviously not convex, right? Okay. Um, so this, the, the history of this goes back, it way pre, it goes back into the 50s at the least, and maybe even earlier. Uh, but it's, it's used in all sorts of cool things, like in sparse design is one. So um, a very interesting example of that is, it was actually used in aerospace in design of structures in the 1950s and 60s. So let me explain how that works. Um, you're going to build a structure, and you put in all these uh, bars that connect two nodes, right? So it's a space frame or something like that. Um, by the way, how many people know what I'm talking about? Because if I, a couple, okay, that's good enough. And the rest should just kind of just pick up the flavor of it, right? So I have a whole bunch of nodes, and I'm, I'm going to put in bars, right? And my variables actually are the cross-sectional areas of the bars. Okay, that's the variables. But what you do is what, uh, the bars, you put in a gazillion bars. You have absolutely no intention to use a million, uh, a million bars in your space frame, right? This could be, for example, the wing of an airplane, right? Or some structure like that. Or some structure in a spacecraft, right? So you, okay. So what you do then is you, you, uh, you actually put an L1 norm on the cross-sectional areas. Um, what's the L1 norm of a non-negative vector? Thank you. Yeah, okay, fine. So, so, so you could actually, what's weird about that is you could look in some of those papers for L1 norm, and you're like, I don't see any L1 norm here. And the reason is the, the things that you're computing an L1 norm of are non-negative, so it's just a sum. Okay, fine. All right. Um, so what happens is you solve this, you design, you, you know, and, and the constraints are, uh, you'd have a limit on weight. Uh, you have a limit, what you also have is a whole bunch of constraints, which are performance related, and it basically says, if I take this structure and I put various forces on various places, can it withstand it, right? I might have a maximum stress limit in each bar or something, everybody. So, so there's a whole bunch of constraints. The comment is strong enough to handle, you know, boost, takeoff, whatever, re-entry, I don't care, whatever this is, right? 
or rough turbulence, all that kind of stuff. Everybody following this? So that's a whole bunch of constraints. Anyway, when you solve this problem, you started, you, you offered it the option of using, they didn't do a million in the 60s, okay, but now they do a million, right? So you offered it the choice of a million bars, um, and what happens is, you know, 322 turn out to be positive, and the rest are zero. Everybody got this? And then it's kind of cool, because someone said, what did you, what did you just do? And you say, um, I just designed this, I just designed the structure. You know, it's a cool structure. You see all these like bars connecting various points and stuff like that. And if your specs were right, it would be a completely reasonable structure. And someone said, that sounds like a combinatorial problem, right? Because you did not, here's what you did not solve. You didn't say, um, I want 322 uh, bars from my, what I'm offering you, which is 1.1 million, right? Because 1.1 million choose 322 is a super big number. Right, so you did not solve that problem. So this is it's a heuristic, um, but that's what happens. Everybody uh, got that. So the, that's already in the '60s. People were doing this, which is kind of cool. Um, I know that there was a great example in. Uh, they do it in uh, circuits. That's a good one. So in circuit design, you're going to build yourself a filter. Um, you might you, you're going to build, let's say, an FIR filter. So, so I'm I'm speaking dialect, but it's okay if people get. So uh, you're going to build yourself an uh, find an impulse response filter, which is a a set of th a bunch of sums and stuff like that. And you design the coefficients. Here the coefficients can be negative. So there's now one norm put in. And you say, I want a filter that has the following specs, but I also want the coefficients to be sparse. So you add an L1 term, it's sparse. And it's very cool because then when you're going to emit the hardware for it, the, when, a, when a coefficient is zero, it means that little block in your actual hardware circuit, you don't even need it. Because I, I know how to... I'm not a hardware designer, but I do know how to I do know how to synthesize hardware that multiplies by zero and adds it to the result, right? That that I can do, right? And the answer is just no hardware at all. Everybody kind of following these, and then of course I think most many of you have seen this in in sort of uh, statistics, actually for two different purposes, at least two. Uh, the first is for uh, sparse features is feature selection, right? So you'd say, here's here's my uh, uh, here, here's a bunch of data. I have 500 patients, uh, you know, two, 250 have one type of cancer, 250 like don't or something like that. Um, here's gene activation data. So I give you, I don't know, you know, 80,000 80, gene expression levels. And then if you put L1, if you put an L1 regularizer on, let's say, just logistic regression to classify the two, then it's going to go in and choose, choose like, you know, 22 genes, right? Everybody, so... By the way, how many people have seen that or something like that in some class? Where, where was it? In like STAT 315 or something? 206. 206? Good. I was kind of hoping for more people to raise their hands on that one. These are like super cool things, right? So like everybody should have seen these things. But anyway, do you know what they do? I have, I have biologist friends. You know what they do with that? So I have a biologist friend who hates math, doesn't trust it. He says it's stupid. It doesn't work. I caught him actually running one of those things. I was like, you're so busted. Like, and he's like, he said, no, I, but I don't trust it. He said, what I do is I take the 22 genes. I look at the first 10 and go like, duh. Like, of course, the, they're related to this pathway because he actually knows biology. He said, of course, that's obviously related to the pathway for X, Y, and Z. And he looks at two others. He says, that has nothing to do with it. Like, that's ridiculous. And he looks at three others and he goes like, hmm. These are people who know genes by, you know, by name, right? He looks at them and he goes like, hmm. That's interesting. That, that actually could be related. That, that could be. And then I said, well, what do you do then? And he said, well, then I just call my lab. He said, and he makes his postdocs go in and knock out those genes and see if something happens, right? And then the next morning, you know, maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't, right? Or whenever the experiment's over. So, yeah. so that, 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 that's fine, right? But, okay. Okay. Um, let's see, some other examples of it. Um, oh, it comes up in... Um, Oh, in a lot of image processing, signal processing, geophysics from the 70s. Uh, oh, there's a, uh, on total variation reconstruction. We've already seen that. That's actually basically an L1 norm applied to a derivative, either a first difference or, for example, in an image, it might be to a gradient, in a space gradient in an image. Um, okay, so these are, and yeah, that's a bit old. I mean, yeah, there's some theoretical results that guarantee the methods works. I mean, that's a, I think it's kind of cool, but I'm, it, whatever, it's fine. <laughs> they work without these methods anyway, so 
Okay. So what we're going to do now is, 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 is uh, look at this and, and you know, go through the stuff a bit more carefully. So, um, so the cardinality is uh, the function I just plotted over here. It looks like that. Um, it's quasi-concave, but I mean, who cares? Because that's not something that tells you congratulations. You can maximize the cardinality of a vector, that's, which is kind of silly. Um, otherwise, you know, it has no convexity properties, right? Um, you have lots of interesting problems like a convex cardinality problem. Here's one that looks like this. Um, so this says here's a set of convex, uh, here's a convex set, say. Um, and what you're going to do is you say, uh, please find in this set the point with the smallest number of non-zeros. Um, this, this is general, but we're going to look at specific examples. You'll see this is a super interesting problem. Um, or you could do things like this. I could, I could, minim I could have a, a standard convex problem here, here, but I could add a constraint that says you can only use uh, you know, k non-zeros, right? So, I mean, in like statistics or machine learning, this would be, you know, maximize my log likelihood subject to some constraints that are required. Then also, oh, uh, PS, you're only allowed to use, you can't use more than 22 features. And I'm giving you a million, right? So that would be that, right? And th there it's called like feature selection. We'll, we'll get to that. Okay, so just a couple of, you know, observations about this. Um, so the, the first one is if you, if you fix the sparsity pattern, then you just get a convex problem, right? So if I tell you, uh, you know, fit my model and you go, okay, you say I have a million features. You say, oh, but only these 22 are allowed to be non-zero and all the rest are zero. Then you're like, uh, okay, because then it's just a problem with 22 variables. Everybody got this? So this is kind of obvious. Um, that means that you could solve uh, two to the n convex problems to, to solve these, right? If n is like a thousand, it's not, I mean, if n is, sorry, n, n is a hundred, it's not, it's, it's, n is less than 10, this is not, in, this might not be insane, right? So, um, yeah, so that's, that, that's one. Um, but this kind of brute force search doesn't work for, you know, obviously for, for, for bigger problems. Um, it's, it's extremely easy to show that the whole thing, that this general problem is NP hard. Uh, I think we'll do that in a minute. And you, you could solve it globally by what are called branch and bound methods. Um, and there's also branch and cut methods. There's all sorts of names for this. It's a whole, whole area, I guess people would call it like mixed integer convex programming. Um, and they might, they, they, these things can work. So, some of them can work spectacularly. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, but anyway, this is, uh, th this, this is, th this is just general ideas about how you would solve these problems, right? So, um, so you can actually express Boolean LP as a cardinality problem like that, right? So, um, so, and I think you've actually done a couple of problems on your risk. First of all, getting computing bounds for Boolean LPs, and then also for uh, heuristics for actually uh, approximately solving them. I, I, I believe you had that in some homework, right? So, so the way that works is you want to solve this problem. Now, by the way, uh, a, solving a set of linear inequalities with Boolean variables is basically like all, you know, kind of all of these problems in computer science. So uh, like everything is that, right? Um, it's things like three sad. It's the traveling salesman problem. I can write down very short descriptions with uh, with zero one uh, variables, um, and you just write it this way, and it's a cardinality problem, and it just looks like this. It's actually the cardinality of x stacked on one minus x is less than or equal to n, right? Because um, this thing tells you the number of entries of x that are non-zero. This tells you the number of entries of x that are not one, right? And so if you add those two together, the smallest that could be is n. And that would be if every x is either zero or one. Of course, if you if you throw in an x that's three point six, then uh, that's going to come out to be n plus one or something like that. That sum, right? Okay, so that immediately establishes that solving convex cardinality problems is like NP hard, right? So, okay, um, okay. So now we'll we'll look at some examples before we get into the methods because they're kind of very very cool. Um, yeah, so sparse design is, C is a set of things that give you your specifications. It says, here's what X has to satisfy. Um, and then you, you simply want the sparsest X that satisfies your conditions, right? Um, 
And the idea there is presumably a zero value of x simplifies the design, right? Or generally, it, it can actually be components that don't even, for example, I think we already talked about a truss design. And a zero coefficient is, it says you should attach a bar between this node and that bar, and what's the cross-sectional area zero? And you're like, okay, as in no bar, right? For an FIR filter, if you're designing a filter, it says there's whole blocks that you just don't need in the hardware, right? So that's what that is. Um, oh, it's used in wire sizing, which is actually really cool. Uh, so I've seen people use this for circuit design and wire sizing, where they, they're, they let's say, generating, um, let's say, a, a, you're synthesizing, which is their word for optimizing, um, a, um, a, a, power, uh, a power distribution network on a chip. Right, so what you do is you put in a whole bunch of wires. You have no intent. It's like you put, in fact, an entire mesh in. Right, you have no intention of actually implementing a mesh because it's going to be too expensive. So you do that. You write down the conditions. It's all pretty straightforward. Right, there's total amounts of of current that have to be go various places and all. Anyway, so you do that. That's going to be C, and then your variables are the uh, actually weirdly that's also it's the width of the wires. They have a constant uh, height. So it's also the cross basically the cross sectional area. And then when you do that, what you'll find is it'll synthesize, it'll, it'll actually choose which wires to use. So you started with a big mesh, and then you'll end up with something. It has to be connected because otherwise you probably wouldn't end up, you wouldn't meet your specs, right? Because one of your specs is that you power up every module on your circuit. So uh, how many people uh, know about that kind of stuff? I hate the idea giving examples that no one gets, but that's okay. I mean, the basic idea though is pretty, uh, is, is pretty straightforward, right? So, um, okay. So these are examples of these things. Um, okay, now we get to machine learning and statistics. Uh, you have sparse modeling and regressor selection, right? So here, uh, I mean, this is, not the, the, this is not the notation that someone in statistics or machine learning would use, but too bad. Um, so here, uh, X, which someone else might call theta or beta, depends on which, you know, what, what, you, what your statistics identity is or machine learning identity is. Um, uh, but here, you're, you're simply saying, uh, please, it says, please select K out of the number of features, I guess M, is that right? Uh, nope, uh, N. Uh, so ch please choose K features to use to fit the model. Right. So, by the way, that's a very strong and pretty good regularizer or something like that, right? Um, okay. And, I mean, you could do this by trying all, uh, you know, n choose k choices. And lots of examples, you know, people have um, things like you could write it as a, a penalized form. Um, you could find the sparsest model that gives you a certain, uh, that gives you a certain um, performance. I guess this would be on your training data. Everybody got that? So that'd be, find me the sparsest thing that actually gives me the following pre-specified performance on the training data, right? So, okay. Uh, so this is the sparse modeling and regressor selection. Um, sparse signal reconstruction, this is a, a big deal. Maybe fading a little bit, but maybe 90s through the, maybe five years ago was kind of a, a big deal. Um, and the typical thing there was this, is you'd say a, no, a measure, you're gonna, you wanna, what you want to do is estimate something like X. Um, so I'll, I'll switch to their dialect, right? So A would be a, a basis, which drives the columns of A would be a basis for the signals. Um, except that, I don't know, since 1820, everyone agreed what a basis was. And people in signal processing decided that they would use their own meaning for it. And they they just dropped the fact that they were independent. I couldn't make this stuff up. And I, then if people challenged them, they'd say, oh, no, you're misunderstanding. This is an overcomplete basis, right? Which, by the way, here's another, you want to know how you describe over, an overcomplete basis? It's a set of vectors. That's what it is. It has no other properties. Anyway, don't get me started on that. Um, but they would say, so the columns of A would be, they would call that their basis, right? E even though... If they said that to any normal person, not in that particular sub 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 field, they would interpret that. They'd say, "Oh, that's cool. It's a basis. Uh, great." Meaning they're in linearly independent and span. Every, it doesn't matter. So do that, and then they would say, "The thing I'm looking for 
is sparse in that basis. So you'd hear things like this. You'd say, well, I think that the, you know, the MRI image I, wanna, I want to recover is sparse in this wavelet basis. That would be the typical kind of thing they would say. Right, and that's, that's, that's fine. Anyway, so that you'd end up with things that would look like this and that would be, these, these are generally things like sparse signal reconstruction. Right? So, okay. Um, another one, which is actually very interesting, this is less often spoken of, I think, is, um, is handling outliers, right? This actually kind of makes sense, um, right? You, what you should have in your mind by now, and I imagine already do, is that when I say something like L1, different things should come up, right? Pictures, a picture in your mind should come up. It should come up as, a, as a, let's say, a sparsifier. And what's sparsifying about it? That point at the bottom. Right? Because roughly speaking, what happens is the pressure to move something to zero keeps up until you're zero, right? There's another property of L1. Uh, you also know that it's a robust, it, you also, when it's a penalty, it's something that's robust, right? And you might, because what happens is that means that for large values, it grows slowly. Uh, it grows as slowly as, it pot, as a convex penalty can, right? So that, and that you would use to do things like, uh, to do sparse stuff, you could have a, a Huber penalty, right? Where it starts out as, le starts out as a square and then transitions to uh, linear, right? So it looks like sort of an L1 for large things. And then that's going to, that's going to play really well when there are really big outliers in your data, right? So these, anyway, these are things you should have in your mind by now, I hope. Um, so it shouldn't be too surprising that the problem of handling outliers uh, is, uh, is, is, is related to this cardinality thing. So here's, here's the, uh, here's, here's the measurement model. It says, I'm going to measure some things. They are linear functions of the thing I want to guess, which is X plus, you know, a, a Gaussian. That's fine. And then plus WI. WI is simply assumed to be sparse. Now, what this means, otherwise that we have no, I, I say nothing about the size of AI. I have no statistical model for WI, sorry. I have no statistical model, nothing. I just say it's sparse. Oh, and it has only K non-zeros. And what this really means is that K, up to K of these measurements, are completely wrong. Because WI can be anything. Right? We didn't say what WI could be. So it basically says, I'm going to give you a bunch of measurements. I'll give you M measurements. Um, I will tell you the following. K of them can be completely wrong. And then you'd say, please fit a model. Everybody following this? So that's a very strong outlier uh, formulation, handling an outlier form, but it's a perfectly good one, right? And you could write this lots of ways. Um, one way is you could write it this way. It says that you are going to select, uh, you're going to select the measurements um, and you will select, you're going to select a set of measurements to ignore. So you're going to, you're going to say, thank you for your M measurements. I, I, in my opinion, I'm going to, I, I think that the 11th, the 22nd, the 48th and the 137th, I think, I think they're complete nonsense. I don't believe them. Right? So you take that. Um, and then you would solve the, you'd toss them out and solve the least squares problem. And you can rewrite that immediately as a, as, as just a simple uh, cardinality constraint model. It looks like this, right? Because, so let me, let, let, let's walk through this. Um, w is, other than this, it's not constrained at all. So if a WI is non-zero, this WI can be anything you like. And I can actually choose that WI to equal this residual here, um, in which case, that means y is ax, right? So that's, this is fine. So if you work out what this is, it's exactly the same as that. Does that, that make sense there? So that's the, uh, that, that's the idea there. Um, okay. Fascinating area uh, has to do with, um, uh, we talked a little bit about this when we talked about phase one methods, is minimum number of violations. So I, I give you a set of convex constraints like M specifications for something. Um, and I, if they're all feasible, great. If they're not all feasible, then I might want to say something like this. Um, please find an X that violates as few as possible. Make sense? So that would be the, that, that would be the picture. You could, you could put weights on it. It doesn't matter, but here, just violate them as few, as few as possible. And so 
That you could write down this way. You, I introduce a slack variable t. If t is zero, then it means you've actually satisfied the ith inequality. But if t is positive, it means you need, you might not have, right? And of course, if you're minimizing the cardinality, if you did satisfy it, you'd take t equals zero here, right? So this, this does exactly what you're asked to do, right? Does that, this uh, make sense? So this would be that, and, yeah. And we'll, we'll see all sorts of cool things happen, yes? Like the feasibility thing we did, we had like one transpose s. Yes. And yeah. We, we could solve that one, right? Yes, you can. Yeah. Or, okay. You have to be very careful. You can quote solve unquote it if that's what you mean. But I guess here the right way to the the way to say it that's that's official would be to say we have a powerful heuristic for approximately solving that problem, comma based on convex optimization. That would be the true statement. You can't solve this problem. Okay. Right. Well, you can if there's like, you know, 10 inequalities, right? But other than that, you can't, if there's 100 inequalities, you can't solve that problem. Maybe I'm just misremembering. I thought that was, that's what we were doing when we had like the one transpose S thing. Nope. The, the, nope. the one transpose S on the slack, uh, that, that was simply a heuristic for approximately solving that problem. But you don't solve that problem. I mean, you might solve it, but you won't know you've solved it. But that's another way to say it, right? Yeah. In fact, in many cases, you probably do, right? Um, yeah. So, and yes, they're, they're going to be related to this, right? Um, okay. So, good example is like a linear classifier. So, I give you a whole bunch of points um, with labels, right? Uh, say, with a Boolean label, yi. And you know, what you want is you want to find W and V. Yeah, so, so this says that you want this to look like that, right? You, you, you want all these to be less than or equal to zero or bigger than or equal to zero. It wouldn't matter whatever your um, convention is, right? Um, and so then you can rewrite this. If you want the classifier that makes the fewest number of mistakes, it's going to be uh, one of these convex cardinality problems. It's going to be this one, right? Um, by the way, when we do our magic or approximation or whatever it is, and we make this into an L1 problem, what do you imagine this is going to turn into? Roughly. <coughs> it's going to turn into a support vector machine, roughly. Right. So, in fact, if I add L2 regularization, that's exactly what it is. So, okay. Um, here's a, a, another weird one. Um, which is not the same. So the story starts the same way. I have a set of infeasible inequalities. In the previous story, which is kind of a weird positive one, it would basically say, um, ignore the fewest number of inequalities to make that feasible. And you go, cool. Of your 22 inequalities, I'm gonna, I, I'm, if I just toss out these five, then the rest I can make feasible. Everybody, that, that's what we're doing. This one says to identify what what is the essence of the mutual infeasibility? So what you're going to do is take, take the original 22, they're mutually infeasible, and I want to get a subset of like, let's say, ideal would be like three. I could say the fifth, tenth, and eleventh. Those three together are infeasible. That means you can forget about the other 19, right? Because it says that, that that's where you're, it's somewhere in these three. And then you kind of negotiate and you go back and you find, you look at these, these three inequalities that are the bottleneck and you try to figure out some way to either expand, you know, whatever, to you go and negotiate for a bigger right-hand side in an inequality or something, bigger budget. Okay. Um, so that's it. Um, so this also is going to work that way as well. Um, so if here, if you work out the certificate of infeasible, it's basic, of infeasibility, it basically says that if the inf over x, this is the dual function, if that's bigger than or equal to one, actually all you need it is to be positive, but it's homogeneous, so that's, that's good enough. Um, if lambda is positive and, and this infimum is bigger than one, then this collection uh, here of inequalities is mutually infeasible. And so now what you're gonna do is you simply minimize the cardinality. So you'd put a comment next to these things. You'd put a comment here that said, this is a certificate proving that these inequalities are mutually infeasible. And if you put, if you minimize the cardinality, you will get 
this, you will get the smallest group subset of mutually infeasible inequalities, right? So, which is actually very cool, right? Uh, I mean, could be quite useful. Okay. Um, we'll give one more example and then we'll, we'll come back next time and talk about what to do about these, right? Um, you also get things in, I mean, here's an example from finance. Um, that doesn't apply to uh, big hedge funds, but it does apply to um, people, right? This, act, this actually uh, comes up in actually in crypto trading. It's the same, same story. What happens is uh, the following. Um, you have a trading fee, which might be uh, proportional, first of all, to the amount that you buy or sell. That's, that's normal. Um, but you also have one that says that is actually, if you buy or sell at all, I'm going to charge you $3 or $9 or something like that. And I forget what this is called in, in uh, crypto trading, but you have to provide like a, a gas fee or something. Anyway, I, I, I don't, anyway, something like that, right? And that's what it would be. So you, so you if you propose to trade at all, you pay a simple fee to request the trade. In that case, there would be no, th this alpha would be zero or something like that. Okay. And your budget constraint might look like this, right? That one transpose X, um, is so here x is either positive or negative right uh or here i guess we want to we're going to purchase some dollar amount so it's all positive so that's the that that's the gross cost of what you're going to buy um this would be uh the the linear the so-called linear cost here and then this part would be the the charge for simply if you buy 14 things you're going to buy 14 times whatever some fixed charges okay um and then you'd end up with a problem that looks like that right so um, without this, um, it's convex, of course, right? Without that. So without that, it's convex. That's an example. Okay. So I think we'll, we're going to quit here for today. Um, next time, we'll finish this up. Um, and that'll maybe go until uh, Tuesday. And then I'll, I'll reserve some time for us to wrap up the whole course as well.